the world population and the economy will grow more slowly towards 2052 than most people expect, but still fast enough to trigger a climate crisis. So we will have slow growth, but sadly, it will not be slow enough to avoid the climate problem. Point two, consumption will stagnate during this period because world society will have to spend ever more on repair and adaptation. They won't do it ex ante, as the economists of you would say, but they will be forced to do it ex post, after the fact. So, you, know, you will have to repair after the hurricanes, although you don't do the smart thing ahead of time. And the third point is very important for, for most of the critics and the ones that want to look at the long history, the future will resemble very much scenario number two in the 1972 book. So get hold of a copy and look at scenario number two out of the 12. That's actually a pretty good picture of the future that I think will transpire over the next uh, 40 years. It was called in 1972 the pollution crisis and the persistent pollutant is CO2. So it happens. Let me try to make it slightly more entertaining and, and try to describe to you what the world might feel like in 2052. So first of all, the important thing about the world of 52 is that it is much smaller than you think. There are much fewer people and the economy is much smaller than you think. If you have ever thought about these issues, you know, it is smaller than what you thought. This is, of course, bad news in one way, because it means that uh, uh, this is slow growth, you know, and most economists and most investors and most employee employees want high growth. And this is, no, I'm telling you that this is going to be slow growth for another 40 years, you know, which is not particularly good news. On the other hand, there is one great advantage from this, and that is the fact that there will be no resource crisis, there will be no energy crisis, there will be no water crisis, there will be no food crisis over the next 40 years. Why? Not because the supply of these things is bigger than most people think, but because the demand will be of the order of one half of what you think. And you go into the umpteen reports that have been produced on resource scarcity over the last 50 years, and you just put in my demand side as opposed to the utopian uh, 10 billion people at middle income levels, you know, and it solves the whole problem. And the problem will be solved. So you don't get resource crisis, you don't get, or we won't get, energy crisis of the types that everyone is bored of, uh, bothered by. Sorry. But, again, bad news. The bad news is, of course, that a lower GDP means more poverty. And that poverty will not only be in the poor world. You know, we will have more poverty in the rich world than you would expect. Because, of course, with the low growth rates, the fraction unemployed will increase. And since, particularly your society, is incapable of making the types of decisions where you take money from the rich and give to the poor. You know, you will get a large number of poor. It will be the same thing in Europe, but Europeans are better at taking from the rich, giving to the poor, and so the problem will be much less accentuated in the rest of the industrial world than it will be in your country. We will have an increasing frequency of scary climate events. You know, so the drought and the, you know, Australia over the last seven years is a wonderful example where they first have a couple of years of floods. You know, so all the pictures are flooded Australia with snakes swimming in the water and the thing. Then there are seven years where they, it's so dry that they can hardly do anything. And now that anyone had gotten used to the drought, they have now had two years of floods again. And so it's very hard, you know, for the Red Cross and everyone else, you know, to follow what's going on. And I think that's a typical indication of what is there. 
So each of those things are not particularly problematic. I mean, we, a rich society is capable of handling a drought or two, but when they start to shift around like this, which is the likely future, it is going to be felt very bothersome because it gets very difficult to plan and run an orderly society. And other interesting things, natural treasures, you know, the type of things I use my high income to enjoy, you know, going to the coral reefs to snorkel, you know, the coral reefs will be bleached, so they will be basically gone, you know, for my children and particularly my grandchildren. The wildernesses will disappear because most of them will be cut down and the ones that haven't been cut down will be flooded with tourists that actually, you know, trample the whole thing. And so, and then in addition to this, interestingly, warming basically means that currently temperature zones are moving at five kilometers, that's three miles a year towards the pole. That's the speed at which, no, the warming is, is moving from the equator towards the poles. And so it means that when I worked in World Wildlife Fund, you know, we celebrated forming great national parks, you know, in order to protect ecosystems. Wonderful, you know, the ecosystem is now escaping north, you know, at three or five kilometers a year. So in 50 years time, you know, what we protected is like 250 kilometers north of, of what we... So everything will be in a transition stage, which makes, again, it is not killing us, but of course it's very unesthetic. You know, it doesn't look good, you know, when you have a wild wilderness system which is not in equilibrium. This is not neat. It looks good. No, it looks bad. Cultural treasures, just to move, because again, I inspire you to read the book because we have then discussed anything. So what will happen on, on that side? Well, the sad fact is that when I want to go to Florence and look at some of the great pictures in the Uffizio, you know, the problem is that there will be like 200 million new other middle class people in line in front of me. And so, already at this point in time, you need to book, you know, a year ahead if you want to see some of the good things. And, and, and now in the future, there will be, you know, a couple of hundred million people from China and India and other places that are in line in front of me, so I won't get in. They, interestingly, closed the Sistine Chapel, you know, in Rome a couple of months ago for tourists. That was the end of this fantastic experience. So those of you who were so stupid that you were so slow that you didn't get to see this thing, you know, you won't see it. Except, of course, you will see it, and that's my next point, that the future will be tremendously virtual. You know, so virtual reality is going to take over most of the real world. You know, so it means that in 2050, when you want to go on a safari, you basically go on the safari by turning on the National Geographic channel and you look at the wonderful three-dimensional pictures with sound and smoke and the whole schmear because that's, of course, much more interesting to watch than the degraded, you know, empty, tourist-filled, uh, uh, what we call it, um, terrorist, threatened, you know, real thing that exists at the time. And so, and of course, Everyone looks at Facebook with interest. That's, of course, just a precursor where you are replacing a real social interaction with the digital version. And so, you know, in all entertainment, clearly, I mean, no one will come to a meeting listening to me. It's much better to have a look, you know, on a screen, and I don't have to travel from Norway. So, this is, you know, that's uh, one of the other aspects. And the final thing in order to avoid making you depressed, because all my advisors say that you must not make the audience depressed. That's very bad. <laughs> is that the one good thing about this is that in 20, if I were dropped in the world of 2050, I would hate it. You know, I love the wilderness and I would love to be one of the few rich you know, when everyone else is poor and, and uh, you know, go to the theater and to the good restaurant, etc. And if I were dropped in 2050, I would hate it. The point is that the people who live in 2050, I won't, uh, have, of course, gotten used to this. You know, so the human adapt adaptability is so tremendous, I've learned from the last two years, that most likely they will object much less strongly to this. 
you know, the guy in the bar in New York will tell me, wilderness? You know, what do I, why do I need a wilderness? You know, a coral reef? Why, what is the point with a coral reef? That doesn't add to my well-being. And so, you know, we will even probably lose the desire for the type of society that I am willing to protect, which is very interesting. And, of course, it softens the blow quite dramatically. 